everyone. Okay, let's get started. So um, we're, I know we didn't assign a uh, particular test last week. Okay, um, so I was hoping uh, you guys can use the time to process tests that you've taken before. Um, and I had some questions on multiple choice that um, how do you, you know, how do you use the data given and how do you look for answers basically. So um, we'll, we'll take a look at those and let me share the screen, we'll get started. Um, and next week is our review. So class will be nine to three, yeah, next week, last the night before AP. All right, just want you guys to know. And also, um, you don't have this test, which is okay. I'm just gonna uh, open it up and kind of go over it, okay? So there's some free response and some multiple choice. Um, we may also look at some of the tests that we've done. So that way uh, we can see uh, um, some of the data analysis, which is more thorough and see what kind of questions you guys have, okay? Um, these are older tests that does have data analysis as well. So we may look at some of those. So I want to see what's in here. And another one, this one here, let me see. Um, let me check this one out. Yeah, this one, I don't think we've done it. This is a, uh, now why don't we look at this one? Okay. So, um, all right, let's, uh, I don't know if I should take notes right now. Yeah, what we'll do uh, next week is that we're gonna spend some time to review and uh, the, different, um, the different units that we need to know. And then the rest of the time, we'll look at another uh, full test, some labs, all the lab review. We're hoping to talk about different variations you might see for different type of uh, lab and questions. Uh, before you guys head off to the test. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So again, uh, if you haven't done this one, uh, if you did, then uh, it's okay. We'll just kind of discuss this together, okay? So let's take a look at this one. Um, let's make sure you guys can see this. Okay, so um, if you look at this, men, men, down, organ now. So this is uh, from the cell chapter. It says here is important component in the evolution of complex multicellular organisms, which of the following that summarizes the advantage of eukaryotic cell. So the question like this is basic organelle, right? So eukaryotic cell produce faster, that's not true. Yeah, uh, bacteria is one of the fastest reproducing organism. And this is the reason bacteria can accumulate mutation a lot faster um, than uh, the rest of us, right? Um, and then here, they're similar to a, this is a true statement. So there's also have true statements. Mitochondria, chloroplast, similar to prokaryotic uh, structure. True, but that is not an advantage, right? So the answer would be C. We have organelles uh, in a small compartment that increase metabolic efficiency. So as simple as that. Okay, all right. Um, and they've been testing Miller and Uri experiment. Remember that experiment that proved that inorganic molecules, when you mix them together under the right condition, reflux over and over, you can produce a number of organic molecules, including amino acids. So that was the experiment, okay? So make sure you know that. Uh, the original Earth is anaerobic, and um, it is also, uh, uh, it's filled with water. There's no oxygen, right? And the first cell evolved under those conditions are prokaryotic cell, all right? So, which of the following best supports the hypothesis, right? So uh, if you look at that, so these choices, uh, you have to go through each one of them and you eliminate. So for example, uh, the molecule essential to life did not exist at the time Earth was formed. Okay, so this is a true statement. How about the second one? The molecules essential to life today could not have been carried out uh, could not have been carried to the primordial Earth by comet and meteorite. So this one should be a toss away because uh, that's not the purpose for the experiment, a uh, meteorite, okay? So again, we're looking for the result that is supported by which of the following. So a molecule essential to life today could have been formed under early Earth conditions. So that's the point, right? So this would be the answer, right? 
Okay, and it's not talking about self-replicating protein. So uh, even though they are prions, which are infectious proteins that can cause diseases. So very weird. Okay. Uh, we have proteins that can come together. Remember the immune system, we have complement proteins. Those proteins can target pathogens and make holes in them. But we also have protein that can go in an organism and misfold and unfold their proteins and enzymes and cause severe diseases, right? So a few years ago, there was the Macau disease was caused by prions, which are protein molecule. Okay, so this one, uh, number three, simple cuboidal epithelial cells, okay? So it's talking about surface area body ratio. So which one would be the most efficient? So you want to be as small as possible, uh, so it would have to be the first one. You can literally calculate the surface area to volume ratio. You want to maximize uh, surface area to volume in order to be efficient. This is the reason cells have to remain small. So they have to have maximum surface area to volume ratio. So a large cell, like the one on the bottom, has very little surface area relative to the volume, and that makes them inefficient in obtaining nutrients, and getting rid of waste. So you can see that uh, a lot of these questions, you're going to get um, um, 60 multiple choice, right? In which you get to use calculator along with uh, six free responses. So make sure um, you run through easy question quickly, yeah? So, and then move on, like uh, don't, don't, don't move at a comfortable pace, moving on with a little bit uh, pace that uh, a Russian, right? So you can get to the data in the set question. Now, we'll come back to some of these questions, uh, but um, uh, I think I may skip around, okay? The idea was uh, I was hoping you guys can also do these. Like, this is the data in the set question, okay? But um, uh, instead of doing this, so if we don't finish this, you can always, uh, you can always uh, do this at home. So I may, I'm going to post this one a little bit later as well, okay? Um, so... Um, you know, when I was going over this, I was thinking that uh, we did not finish the last year's AP Bio yet. So I should do that first. I always forget to do that because last year was the, you know, was the year that it, it came out, right? So we want to make sure we get that. So that's from 2021, okay? So let me just open that one up. We'll finish that one first, okay? So I think we did this one, which is question number six, the last one. Remember that was the expression for the heat shock protein, right? We were talking about which one was uh, used to uh, prevent heat shock, and the other one is to repair uh, the heat shock protein. So we did that one. So let's go back. I think we have like two more or something, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at this one. This is on 2021. Just want to make sure we get this done, okay? We have two more. All right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, this is an, okay, uh, these are four point question, right? Remember the first row 10, these are four points. So here we have amyopline complete their cycle, including germination, seed production, and death. So they tell you exactly what the cycles are if you are an amyopline, right? So you would have to germinate out of the seed and germination requires water, requires the right temperature. You don't, when plants germinate, they don't use sunlight. Uh, it's under the soil, right? So they don't use sunlight because they don't do photosynthesis when they germinate. They use cellular respiration to power the metabolic process. So make sure you remember that. When a seed germinates, what is the major source of energy? It is not photosynthesis, even though it is a plant. Uh, the leaves and everything is not properly formed, and you're still mostly underground. Even if you germinated out of the soil, you're relying on cellular respiration, not photosynthesis. So please remember that. Now the seed production, um, so those, that's definitely important. You want it to uh, be fertilized, pollinated, fertilized, so you can produce seed, right? The seeds will be enclosed in fruits if these plants are fruit bearing, right? And then ultimately the plant will die and the cycle starts over again. So it's talking about this ragweed. Is an annual plant that readily colonizes land that had a disturbance, such as plowing, fire, natural disaster. So we're told about this giant ragweed. The plant is considered invasive. So we, we also need to know every time you hear invasive, 
uh, you need to talk about why invasive species are bad for the native right uh, plants all right so they have an unfair advantage right so in a particular region the seeds of this and this is the uh right here this is the giant weed okay so the seeds of this germinate from early march through the end of the summer while the seeds of other annual plants require warmer soil temperature and thus germinate from late april to the end of the summer so we're told a very specific information and that's the information you need to highlight and come back to because the difference between this invasive plant seems to be the advantage of being able to germinate earlier than others imagine if you had a piece of land that has been cleared by disturbance the ability to germinate early will play a huge role right your first air to access the resources and to grow to establish roots and colony before other uh, native plants that can come in right so the first to establish uh dwelling right so that's a very important uh difference here so that's new right so always keep in mind whatever is new whatever you think is uh, useful make sure you highlight it so researchers study the influence of ragweed on the biodiversity of other annual plant species and because we're told this is invasive it's probably not going to be good for the other plants okay so in early spring the researcher marked off an identical plot of land in a field that had been plowed the previous fall but not planted not replanted okay so you have field all plants that grew on one half of the plot were left untouched so that is figure a on the left so okay so they're and while all germinating rag resealing were removed from the other half of the plot throughout the spring and summer, which is B. So what's the difference here between A and B, right? We are told that all plants that grew on one half of the plot were left untouched. So figure A basically left it alone. And look what happened. Um, you have a whole bunch of X's. So what is X? Ah, here we go, right? So you have the key. So if you leave it alone, you got a whole bunch of X, and X is the giant ragweed. So that's the invasive plant, the X, okay? Now, what about B? So what is B again? Uh, B says that you remove the ragweed from the other half. And then if you remove the invasive species, and the other guy seems to come in, the circles, triangles, and squares, they came in. So you can see the effect of the ragweed, right? Left untouched, ragweed took over uh, and reduced biodiversity. So that's what we expect, all right? And here, representation of plant, make sure you read the figures, yeah? So even though uh, the key and the diagram maybe suffice, make sure you read the figure because they might produce uh, additional information. So you have the plant identity and distribution in the experimental plot in the late summer. Each box represents one typical experimental plot and each symbol represents 10 individual plants. But well, that's good information because I thought one symbol is one plant. No, one symbol is 10 plants, right? So you can actually calculate how many plants uh, were in the subject area here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I see 12 of them, so that's 120 uh, plants. So that will be the sample size, 120 plants, okay? That gives you the credibility of the sample uh, you have to use enough sample size to make a good generalization, yeah? So you have 120 in each plot. If you have 1,200, that's, that's a better experiment. That's how you would improve the experiment, right? And remember, uh, when you do this, you're measuring the bar. So your dependent variable should be of uh, species, yeah? And your x-axis will be time. Okay, so you measure the diversity. So um, <clears throat> you can ask to plot this one, right? But this is later question, question number five. It's not going to be plotting. Okay, let me see what happened here. Okay, I need to go to the next page. So here, all right. So part A is one of those uh, general knowledge about concept question that requires you to describe a cause of logistic growth of the rack wheat. So this has nothing to do with the data, uh, just a general knowledge of what is logistic growth, right? So if you recall, uh, any logistic growth will follow a S-shaped curve, right? Okay. 
somehow sometimes it turns off on its own and then uh, I can get started. Okay, let me try again. Okay, so logistic growth, one more time, um, is different from exponential growth. So you want to start thinking about, all right, so if we have to talk about logistic growth, okay, uh, you would have to talk about uh, specific stuff, right? So what is the, what is something about logistic growth that you can talk about? Remember it grows slowly initially, and then grows exponentially, and then starts slowing down. Remember the slope is the rate of population growth because it's a change in population, size divided by change, changing time. And then they seem to fluctuate right around carrying capacity. Okay, so the carrying capacity, once again, is the maximum population size this particular environment can hold. So you want to talk about all the specifics of this logistic growth. So if you look at the question again, okay, um, what is exactly that you asked to talk about, right? So you asked a, a cost, so they, they do this on purpose too. What the heck is the cost of logistic growth? What causes logistic growth to occur, right? And you're gonna describe it. So what do you think causes logistic growth to occur, right? Um, so when I think about this question, the first thing that came to mind is different stages of logistic growth, because you got the stage one where you grow slowly. And the reason for the lagging slow phase is that the population does not have individuals, does not have enough individuals to grow. So you, not because there's resources that are, that are limiting at the initial stage, there's plenty of resources. It's just that there's not enough reproducing individuals. Now at the logistic uh, exponential phase of the logistic growth, is always about 50% of the population. Mathematically, if you ask to identify the, the uh, exponential phase is 50% of the carrying capacity, okay? K is the carrying capacity. So divide carrying capacity by two. If carrying capacity is 1,000, then the exponential phase will occur about 500. So this is when all the members are reproducing at the fastest rate. You have plenty of resources. There's no limiting factor. And then you start to slow down. So this is slowing when birth rate start to equal to the death rate, right? Birth equal to death. And the reason is because this is when the limiting factors, limiting factors kick in. So the limiting factors, you always have to memorize the four or five limiting factors that you can talk about and apply to the question. One limiting factor would be resources, right? Like food. In this case, they're plants, so they don't hunt for food. This would be the amount of sunlight, the amount of water, the amount of carbon dioxide. So basically, the template is the amount of resources available, right? Okay, and what other limiting factor could be? There's also predation, right? Predator that prey on the population, keeping the population down. Again, these are plants, so this would be herbivory. Don't say predator. Um, and then plants can be predators, right? So number three, would be disease, right? Can plants suffer disease? Yes, they have viral fungal diseases that limits this and also competition, right? So if you want to talk about limiting factor here, the most likely one will be competition because the ragweed, the invasive species are better competitors than the natural annual plant native ones that live in the area because they can germinate early and establish themselves before everybody else came along. So that's probably, uh, you know, competition for resources. Now, some people can link these together. This is different. Uh, competition for resources and resources limiting is different. You, when you compete for resources, the resource may be plenty. But if the resources become limiting, there isn't enough resources. So these are two different factors. So don't worry about, talk, talk about the resources and feel like uh, if you talk about competition, you're repeating yourself. These are not repetitive, yeah? All right, so these all could be the things that describe a cause of logistic growth. So why do you get an S shape? Why don't you grow exponentially? The cause would be limiting factors, right? So you can talk about the limiting factor. You can also talk about the exponential stage. Uh, why does it grow exponentially? What is the cause of exponential growth when resources are not limiting, right? But the best one here I would talk about is the limiting. So what causes to slow down? What caused logistic growth? 
So you could talk about these, all right? And there's a description. So don't just say competition. So you could say that uh, the logistic of, and you're talking about the ragweed, right? You're not talk about the native plant. So you can say that the ragweed grows uh, exponentially, but ultimately it slows down because due to the competition of the annual plants, or you can talk about because the space right now, right? Uh, resources start to be limiting. So you can talk about any of those. So um, so please memorize uh, the explanation of uh, the, uh, the three stages of logistic growth so that you can apply them to any kind of question. So let's look at the uh, answer key. Okay, so we 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 want to now focus on the uh, scoring guide, which is also here. Okay, and see what the scoring guide says, right? Okay. So let's see. We have this question number five. Okay. So question number five here. So there are step one of the following, right? So a factor that become limiting will cause the population size to stabilize. So you can talk about what space, amount of sunlight, herbivory. Phosphor, nitrogen, that's nutrient, and that's the food, right? And other density dependent factor become limiting. So did they restrict us to particular one? No, you can just talk about anything, okay? So long you talk about something to describe the possible slowdown uh, or uh, around carrying capacity, right? Okay, um, they didn't talk about the exponential or the lagging phase, yeah. So. Um, yeah, otherwise you grow exponentially, right? Well, so what causes to logistic uh, to kind of stabilize and slow down? So talk about the limiting factor, okay? All right, let's look at the next one. Um, next one here, based on the representation, representation of figure one, again, figure one is that, uh, is the, right here, that is part A. So what is part A again? Part A is uh, when you don't touch anything. So you leave it as is, let the nature run its course. So this is what we get, okay? So that's figure one. So what about figure one? Okay. Uh, actually, there's also part B, right? Explain why scientists claim that plot B would be more resilient than plot A in response to sudden environmental change. Okay. So this is why we need biodiversity, right? So that's the, basically that's the reason. And you gotta explain a little bit. So you can't just say biodiversity, okay? Uh, that would not be an explanation. So uh, every time you have environmental changes, and that can be climate change, can be change in the amount of sunlight, can be drought, can be raining season. Uh, whenever there's biodiversity, there are variations to ensure that the population as a whole have a chance to survive and reproduce, right? If you have a monoculture, which is how you describe plants that is only one kind, yeah? Monoculture or a clone of identical plant, then when there's an environmental change, okay, in terms of sunlight, in terms of amount of water, humidity, right? In terms of temperature, in terms of wind, pH, right? Uh, or drought, fire, then everyone either survive or everyone either die because they are genetically most likely identical. So you always want to have uh, biodiversity in that sense. It's the same with the human population, right? Uh, you see that we were struck by COVID and there's so many different people with genetic variations that respond um, so differently to COVID viruses. For most people, uh, they're, it's just a simple cold or some people have no symptom and some people caught it and then died within days. Um, so. We cannot explain why no scientists can. And some people are suffering from long COVID. So how the COVID interact with anyone's body, uh, it depends on the genetics and genetic variation. It's not even targeting a particular ethnicity. That's so weird about COVID. So you always wanna have genetic variation. And to ensure this genetic variation, you wanna eliminate invasive species, which give them additional advantage, right? And you want to make sure there's a lot of cross pollination, cell pollination, and cross pollination. We also have people confuse those two terms. Uh, both terms are sexually reproducing. Okay, you cannot say a plant that undergoes cell pollination is asexual. No, all plants, all flowering plants that has flowers are sexually reproducing plants. It's just that when you have 
self pollination, uh, you still do meiosis. Um, you still sexually reproducing, but there's no genetic variation because you contribute both the male and female counterparts. So you produce identical ones uh, versus cross pollination. So if you look at the plants that do cross pollination, they're usually more vibrant in color. They usually have nectars, right? Uh, so they usually have things or scent that can attract pollinators. And those pollinators get benefited because there's usually reward for pollinating. So they usually rewards like fruits, like nectars, right? So they get pollinated or they get trapped. Uh, sometimes they, you have the Venus flytrap, right? They release scents to attract flies and then they, they kill them, right? Okay, so plants can be predator in that sense, I guess, yeah. So both of these are sexually reproducing. So please remember that. Okay, they do meiosis, the anther of the flower produce pollen. Flowers have pollen. Pollen is a sperm cell. Okay, it carry two sperm cells, yeah. Pollen gland carry two sperm cells. And the, um, the ovule has the egg. The ovule is within the ovary, okay? So when the plant is fertilized, the ovules becomes the seed and the ovary becomes the fruit, yeah? Ovary contains the ovule, becomes the fruit. So now as an animal that eats the seed, uh, so it eats the fruit, uh, it gets to dis disperse the seed. So this is the next stage, the seed dispersal. Okay, so remember, uh, pollination have to come first, and then fertilization next, and then the development of seeds within the fruit, and then seed dispersal, okay? So this is for flowering plants, which is the most successful and most genetically diverse. That's why they're so successful, because they're diverse in genes, in varieties. So pollination leads to fertilization. That's when sperm and egg, right? Fertilization allows the seed production. And once seed is produced, fruit will enlarge itself, fruit development, and then you have the dispersal, okay? seed dispersal. So those are the proper steps. If you're a plant, this is what you have to do, okay? Like that, all right? So please know this. Um, and then uh, this uh, will involve animals. Uh, so either you're wind pollinated by wind or water or by animals. Animal can be insect. They can be mammals like bats and also birds. Yeah, so these are the common ones that helps to pollinate, okay? All right, so please know some of those terms uh, so that you can get a, a question going. Let's look at this one then, so, right? So this is genetic variation. So let's look at what they say. Uh, Prop B is more resilient because it has much greater species diversity than Prop A does. Okay, I use, uh, I say variation, but to be more specific, it, it is the species diversity. And when you look at the biodiversity, don't forget there's two parts to the biodiversity, right? Uh, when you look at the biodiversity, make sure you talk about, if you have to elaborate on biodiversity, what are the two components uh, that we usually talk about? There's more than two, but uh, we talk about the species richness, which is the number of species. In this case, that is uh, the biodiversity we, we talk about. And then the species abundance, right? So how many of the number per species? Number per species. Okay. So you can talk about either one, uh, or you can just say biodiversity, it's not a big deal. But just know that there's two components. And AP actually goes a uh, further step to talk about, remember uh, the biodiversity, there's that formula, Simpson diversity. Right? So make sure we know how to use it. Do that next week, Simpson, Simpson Diversity Index. Yeah, let me not, let's not do that right now. Okay, let's finish this. All right, uh, then now this is a part C. So remember, this is four points. So A, B, C, D, one point each. Okay, and you have to write enough, okay? All right, in a third group of plots, so now there's additional third group. Now the researcher removed all the ceilings of all the plant that germinated before June 1st. So this is the first time we mentioned time. So you take away all everybody that germinated June 1st. Okay, so 
Okay, and all plants that germinated after June first were left untouched. So this is the important, uh, very uh, important uh, adjustment to the uh, to the experiment. So this is you're trying to ex experiment something using a template in the space provided for your response, and the symbols you have shown in Figure One represent the expected plant species that will be found in this third group. Three months later, draw no more than 12 symbols. Assume all the other environmental conditions are the same. So you want to fix all the other variables. And the only thing that changed for the third plot is that you remove all the seedlings that germinated before June 1st. OK, so what is the importance of June 1st? So that's the cutoff day, right? So you take away all the ceiling that germinated. So this has to do with now the timing of these uh, plants. Remember, uh, we are told that um, the ragweed, right? The giant ragweed germinate early March, and everybody else germinated late April. So June 1st, you take out all the ceiling. So basically, you remove the advantage that rag we have right so you take out the rag we advantage by removing everybody that germinated june 1st so that's what the importance here is so you take out the all the ceiling you essentially remove a rag we's advantage so what would you expect then uh to draw this right okay um so what we should expect is that if ragweed have no longer advantage, then you should have even distribution of all species, right? Okay, so that's the uh, no hypothesis. Okay, uh, so that's that's what you expected to see. And it says to draw twelve, no more than twelve. So let's draw twelve. And how many species have we got here? We got uh, we got four, including the ragweed. So since you removed everybody. Then your third plot here should have even number of species. So I'm going to get three ragweed and distribute them evenly. Right? There's no reason they should be come together. So this would be the other, the triangle, the square, wherever you want to put this, and then the circle, right? Okay, so maybe like that. So this is what you expected to see. Yeah, and that would be the answer. Okay, okay. Again, it's about the timing. So uh, you would actually have to read. Uh, in the question and to recognize that, all right, what is the selective advantage for this uh, ragweed? Is the ability to germinate early? And that's super important, yeah? Uh, that's super important if you're a parasite. If you're a parasite on a plant, like mistletoes, you wanna make sure you germinate after your host already germinated because that would be kind of the opposite here. Because if you germinate before the host, you have no food, you have no organism to to parasitic on, right? So then you die. So you have to make sure the host is there and the host is growing uh, healthily before you germinate yourself to leech on the host, right? All right, so number D, how an invasive species such as ragweed affect the ecosystem of biodiversity as illustrated. So this is just a general statement. You don't have to talk about ragweed. It just explain in general how invasive species, right? So. Whenever you talk about invasive species, you can talk about a bunch of stuff. Let's look at that again. Yep. So this is basically uh, somebody's drawing. So even number. All right. So what is the advantage of invasive, right? So you can talk always talk about the same thing. Okay. Uh, you can talk about, for example, <clears throat> uh, there's no predator. Okay. Of the invasive initially, right? When they first show up. Uh, nobody knows what to do with them. So there's just a new organism. There's no predator that's been feeding on them or preying them, right? But if you make sure you answer the question. You, you can't just say there's no predator without, without talking about biodiversity. So you got to connect that to biodiversity. So what about if you're no predator? So that means that it has an unfair advantage to grow without predation, right? And that would utilize the resources otherwise available for other species so you want to kind of talk about that make sure you answer the question though when they say explain you cannot just state a characteristic that 
they have no natural predators. You would have to connect to what you're trying to explain. The explanation is how does that affect the ecosystem's biodiversity? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes people make on AP Bio is they didn't answer the question. They know what's going on, but they just didn't take the time to read the question over a few times and make sure you are answering the question. Okay. All right. You can also say that in this case, that germinate earlier, use up all the resources and less resources are available for native plants. And therefore, uh, there's less biodiversity. Make sure you explain biodiversity. And then you can also say they outcompete other species, right? Now, we don't know how they outcompete other species. Every situation is different. Some plants can outcompete species because the generation time is shorter. Imagine you try to compete with somebody doubles every two days, where yourself doubles every week. Now, how are you going to compete with that, right? Because they already doubled like three, four times when you just doubled once. So sometimes uh, invasive species, if you ever helped out gardening, guys, uh, some those are weeds, they have very deep roots. So it's very hard to pull them out. And some weeds, they have very shallow roots. You just tuck it and it comes out. So that is another advantage. If you're able to have deeper, uh, more extensive roots, right? So those would be uh, all possibility. If this is animal, then let's say it's a beetle invasive beetle. Why would an invasive beetle have advantage over natural native beetles? We don't know. If you make something, it could be some kind of phenotype that they have. Maybe they have longer wings that they can fly greater distances, and so they can be more competitive at searching for food, right? Maybe they can catch uh, prey better. So there's just, you can make something up, right? So if you're not sure, make up something. You don't uh, but if, the, if you don't see the, uh, the, the clue in the, in the question, then just make up something, yeah? Uh, so, but know some of these advantage of invasive species. Yeah? They either grow faster, uh, they have characteristics that allows them to be more competitive, there's no natural predator in the environment. Um, there it is. Okay, let's look at one more. So I think this is, uh, we did number three, do we? Yeah, so we're almost there. Uh, I think we have number four. Let's do number four. So let's look at another one. This is four point question. Okay. Uh, so you have 1981, you're told a single immature male. And then this one, uh, I don't want to pronounce this. This would be GC Finch, right? You can just say that. Flew more than 100 kilometers from Galapagos Island to Espoin and this is Point Panuela, okay, to the Galapagos Island of Daphne Majors. That is confusing. Exactly where is it flowing? They all Galapagos Island, right? So you flow flow from uh, from es Espanola to Daphne Majors. Okay, so this is an immature male, and there's only one bird flew over, and we're told about their environment. So where no GC finches were living, so there's no no GC finches are there. The immigrant finch bred with a female GF, the fortis one, right? A species of finch commonly found on definitely majors. Okay, so we're told that. So definitely majors have GF, and one of the male from G is GC male flew over to definitely majors. But the F1 finches and later generation interbred only within their lineages. Okay, so that means uh, they don't breed with other birds. Okay, so that's just a fine detail. Okay, the hybrid, between GC, which is the male, and the GF, which is the female on the definitely majors, their hybrid is the F1, okay? By 2012, that's many years later, right? From 1981 to 2012, scientists counted 23 individuals, including eight breeding pairs within this hybrid lineage on definitely majors. So we got 23 individuals, yeah? Some of them are breeding, some of them are not, okay? The hybrid lineage became known as the big bird, all right? So those are the big birds. The, the babies are called big bird. Birds with different beak shape, size, eight different type of food. So this is a clue, right? We know that already, but you're told this. Uh, the dimensions of the big bird's beak relative to the beaks of other major competitors on definitely islands are shown. So here is the data. And if you look at the data, we're told the beak depth 
And uh, the other one is the length. So how long the beaks are and how deep the beaks are. And then this is worth a little bit of time to look at, right? You have the depth and length, and you can see the big bird is right here, which is the squares. So these are the big bird, okay? So when I first look at this data, I'm looking at, okay, the big birds are around this length, about 13, and they're about this deep, right? Most of 13, yeah? And also the way to look at this is that if I were to ask you as an additional question, um, the big birds, do they have unique length or do they have unique depth? What do you guys think? Yeah. So do they have unique length or unique depth for the beaks? Uh, you should say that they have unique depth, right? So it seems like this is unique to the big bird, right? They don't have unique length because these guys have the same length, right? So, so do the, some of the circle, right? So they don't, right? All right, so you can kind of look at this. All right, next one is that uh, figure one, the dimension of the beaks of the big bird lineage and its major competitor species. Um, each symbol represents the beak dimension of a single bird. So there's one bird, okay? So by A, the big bird lineage became reproductively isolated from the GF. So again, the GF is the mother, right? The mother species, and they become reproductively isolated. So name one prezygotic mechanism likely contributed to the reproductive isolation. So if it's prezygotic mechanism, we know like five, that geographical isolation, geographical isolation, right? Or habitat isolation, there's the temporal, isolation, there's the behavioral isolation, there's the mechanical isolation, right? Mechan uh, the reproductive structures don't match. There's also gametic. So the gametes do not recognize each other. So these are the five prezygotic. So you're gonna describe one of those that likely contribute to reproductive isolation. So usually uh, these kind of question, I go back to the reading to see if there's any clue. Uh, what is it about the big bird that um, uh, that caused them to be reproductively isolated? Okay, and then uh, if you look at this again, it doesn't say. It just says that uh, the F1, the big bird, uh, interbreed with only their lineages, and you have this, and they have all we know is that they have different beak shape and sizes, and eat different type of food, and that's all. So if they don't give you a, a, a specific clue, or if you're not sure, just write whatever, yeah? You wanna get the points and chances are, it doesn't matter which one you write. If they don't give you enough to identify a specific prezygotic mechanism, talk about whatever you want and then apply them to this in example. So I could say that the big birds are mechanically isolated, I don't know that, but then I got to explain what I mean, right? Because you got to describe it. That means that the big birds have different structures and function and the mechanical, uh, the reproductive organs don't match, something like that. You can also say that the big birds may be geographically isolated from other species, okay? Uh, so they interbreed with only their lineages. Um, that would be fine, okay? It could be behavioral. Maybe they have different mating rituals that other species don't have. So let's see what the answer key will take here for the big bird, okay? So this one here, um, let's see. Uh, okay, so, so right here. So they will take uh, step one of the following, beak, size, shape, song behavior, that's behavior isolation, mechanical isolation or chemical differences, okay? Or time of mating or location on the island, or the, where the food is. So basically they accept everything, yeah? Accept everything. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of, yeah. So they say describe one that likely contributed. We don't know which one, so they accept everything. That's kind of silly, yeah? They should have left some clue in the question, but they didn't. Let's look at the second one. Uh, if you look at the next question, uh, based on the data in figure one, explain 
why the big bird population has been able to survive and reproduce. So you cannot guess here, it says to based on the data. So this is data based, evidence-based reasoning, yeah? So you gotta go to the data. So why can they survive and reproduce? I'm looking here, this is the data. So remember we're pointing out the data, they have unique uh, structures that maybe that allows them to specialize in a particular type of food source, right? That other birds are unable to. So that means they have access to, uh, they specialize to a particular food source. They have access to food. Uh, that would be my best guess, right? So that would be the answer. So based on the figure, you can say that uh, the big bird have, uh, uh, based on the data, the big have unique, you know, beak depth, right? Uh, unique beaks if you don't want to talk about the beak depth, right? But there's the depth of the beak, that's unique, right? Allow them to specialize in a certain type of food and without being out-competed by others. And this gives them ability to survive and reproduce, all right? So let's look at what the answer he says, okay? Uh, should be something similar. So the birds have a beak size shape that differ from the beak of other competitors. So I say unique, but you can also say they're different from other competitive finches. So they don't compete with the other one for food. So the niche don't overlap. So they avoid competition, and then they're able to specialize on food that others don't consume. So that is a good explanation. If you simply put down, they have unique size uh, and depth of the beaks, then maybe that's not explaining enough, but further to say that this allows them to avoid or minimize competition and create their own specific niche. That, that would be a much better and strong example, okay? So uh, when you explain it, so read it again, do I need to include that? Yes, because if you just say they have unique beak size and shapes, you did not explain it. How is a unique size and shape in their beaks allow them to survive and reproduce, right? So the explanation requires you, or that minimizes competition so that they can special, they, can, they have a unique source of food. They don't have to compete with others, right? So you do have to elaborate that. So when they say explain, I think that's the explain and justify is the most difficult because you have to read it several times to see if your response actually explain what they want you to explain using the data. If you don't use the data, something is wrong. Or if they ask you to justify something, you have to make sure that you justify with data as well, evidence, right? Alrighty. And number C, a virus infects and kills G GM. This is another finch, right? It does not affect other finch species. Assume the food and the availability stay the same. Everything else is the same. It's just that virus kills GM. Predict the most likely change in the big phenotype of the big bird population after six more generations. So let's look at who are the GMs, right? So here's the GM. I'm looking at uh, this is the top one. So the GMs are these. So these are the GMs. So imagine now a virus wiped them out. So pretend they are not there anymore. And the question asks us to predict what will happen to the phenotype of the big birds. How is the big birds affected, right? Okay, so by looking at this is that uh, the most potential competitor to the big, big birds would be the GM, right? So these are the most likely competitor to the big birds because they have the most similar uh, structures in the bees. So by clearing out the GM, this probably opened up uh, more food and resources available for the big birds. So there is possibility that the big birds with deeper beaks and longer beaks are selected for. So there is going to be a directional selection favoring the longer and deeper beaks, okay? Because now the, the resources that, that was previously not available becomes available, right? So that would be a common conclusion, okay? 
So if you want to answer this question, then you can address that, right? So let's see the question one more time. So a virus kills the GM, but does not affect everybody else. So predict the most likely change in the big phenotype. And D is to further justify your prediction. So my prediction is that the big phenotype or the big bird population uh, will be shifted and, um, right, will be shifted. So it will be deeper and uh, longer. The beaks are likely to be deeper and longer. Okay. Um, and then my justification is that uh, without GM, uh, GM is the closest competitor. So without GM, uh, resources that were previously not available now are becomes available so that the big birds with larger or more deeper and longer beaks are selected for and their population increase in frequency okay um so let's see what the uh, answer key says let's see if they accept other things right so it's always good to look at the answer key because ooh, if you look at this one uh, they, they allow for a bunch of different predictions, yeah? You can talk about the average peak size. You don't have to say depth or the length. They will increase. Uh, peak will become longer and deeper. Frequency of large peak will increase. You can even say option four. Look, you can, prediction is the peak size will remain the same. And as long as you can justify it. How do you justify it? Well, one, two, and three is similar. So they justify the same way. Uh, they say there will be a directional selection for larger beaks because larger seeds are more accessible, okay, I guess. And so basically resources becomes more available, right? Um, for, the, for the big birds to take advantage of. If you say the beak size will remain the same, then you can say that, okay, so here it says six generations may not be enough time to see a visible change in phenotype. That, that, that will be fine. So, or you can say there's little genetic diversity because of all the birds descended from a single pair, there's only 23, right? And the birds are only six generation from a founder. So that not enough generation to produce enough variation. Okay, uh, and why is that important? Uh, because if there's little genetic variation, how do you select beaks? Uh, that, that are larger. Maybe they're all about the same size. There's very little generation. But I don't like that answer because from the data, it doesn't seem that way. It seems like there's a good amount of variation. Some are like less than 12. You can see the, the big birds. Uh, and some are actually uh, about 15. But each each data point is only one bird. So who knows? That, 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 that there's not enough genetic variation, yeah. But anyway, so you can BS your answer if you're not sure. Uh, this points to that if you get those prediction questions, there's really no wrong or right answer as long as you can justify it, right? I think previously I was talking about the antibodies pass from mother's breast milk to baby. Uh, with the baby, how the baby would be affected if the baby were the same virus that mother had three months ago, right? You could say that baby gets sick, or baby remain healthy, or even that baby die, right? So a swim can justify it, right? There may not be enough uh, antibodies in the breast milk to make sure that, that the baby receive to protect the baby fully, so it can get sick, right? So there's prediction one, just keep in mind, you cannot leave a blank. Uh, there's always prediction questions, yeah? There's uh, describe, explain, justify, identify, calculate. Those are the common mm -hmm. terms they use. It's always the same term. Explain and justify is the hardest. Make sure you read it at least few, three, four times to make sure your answers are explaining uh, or justifying. Otherwise, you might have the right idea, but you missed the whole thing. All right, let's look at this one, last one here. So we have a researcher hypothesized that the plant compound uh, this compound called resveratrol, I don't know how to pronounce it, so just the compound, improves mitochondrial function. So, well, that's important, right? So again, when you do this, you're learning about new things. So what does that mean? To test this hypothesis, researcher dissolve this compound in DMSO, which is a solvent. It's a very common solvent, okay? 
the solution readily passes through the cell membrane. So when I read this, the first thing pop to mind is that, well, the, the, the solution must be nonpolar, right? You have to pass through the membrane. But that, that does not have to be the case, though. Okay. Um, so they added the compound solution to mammalian muscle cells growing in nutrient-rich medium containing glucose. So I guess that's your experiment, right? You want to see that uh, <coughs> this compound, what does that do to the muscle cell? How does it improve mitochondrial function, right? Okay, so they measure the ATP production at several time points after the addition of the compound solution. I find an increase in ATP production. So we're told about the finding. So we're looking for how we know that it improves mitochondrial function. So we put it into the muscle cell and then they measure ATP production and found out that there is an increase in ATP by muscle cell. So essentially the compound makes you produce more ATP. Uh, and this is from mitochondria. So this is aerobic respiration, not anaerobic fermentation, right? So this is improving mitochondrial functions and so forth. So part A, describe the primary advantage of mammal muscle cells in using aerobic respiration. So this one uh, has nothing to do with the uh, question. One of those biological concepts you need to know. So basically, what is the advantage of aerobic? over anaerobic fermentation. So the major advantage is that aerobic respiration produces 36 ATP versus fermentations 2 ATP, right? So you're much more efficient at getting ATP out of a glucose molecule. So again, an aerobic, you net 36 instead of netting only 2. So the advantage is being very efficient, right? Uh, that is the advantage. So you produce more ATP, you're more efficient, right? Uh, so that's it, yeah. And let's look at that uh, second one. Identify an appropriate negative control for this experiment that would allow the researcher to conclude that ATP is produced in response to the compound. So what about, what do you guys think, yeah? Um, I think most of you guys at home <laughs> have this, uh, you know, PowerPoint off, yeah? No, the video camera off, but just, you know, if you, if you can contribute, that would be great. So what is a negative control? Negative control means that your, again, every control allows you to see the effect of your experiment, right? So the result of the experiment must be compared to the control. Negative, negative control <clears throat> means that you don't, you, not, you don't see what you're supposed to see, right? So negative control here will simply be the solution without the compound put into the mammal, uh, mammalian uh, muscle cell. Because the effect, the experimental variable is the, the compound, okay? So your negative control should be without the compound. So just the solution. Uh, you cannot say you have to put the solution, okay? Because otherwise you introduce two variables. Uh, you're missing two variables. If you don't say, if you just say muscle cells, um, without the compound, that's not good enough. You can say the muscle cell with DMSO only without the compound because you don't want to introduce more variables than necessary, right? So there can only be one variable. So that would be the answer. So that would be a negative control. Let's see what the answer he says for this one. Okay, um, so this one here. Last question, we're, we're going to move on to more. So yeah, so this one would be Okay, so they actually take it. Okay, so run the experiment without adding the compound. Okay, I would I would actually uh, argue with this one, but you can also say you treat the cell with the DMSO, the solution alone, yeah? Uh, but they will take it. So either way, you put something down and you might just get it right. All right, next one. What is the effect of short-term ATP production when the compound-treated mammal muscle cells are grown in a medium that lack glucose? So the short-term production, of course, if you don't have glucose, then you're not going to get production. Now you can that the cell would be some glucose, actual, but either way, there will be no ATP production or there will be a reduced ATP production. 
because you don't have a constant supply of glucose. So that's easy, right? Super easy. Next one. Um, next one, uh, part B. The researcher finds this compound stimulates the production of components of the electron transport chain, which is in the mitochondria. So the researcher claimed that the treatment with the compound also increases oxygen consumption by the cells if glucose is not limiting. If there's plenty of glucose, it causes the muscle cell to consume more oxygen. That makes perfect sense because in order to do cellular respiration using mitochondria, electron transport chain, you will require oxygen to be the final electron acceptor to remove the electron as they accumulate, right? So that the electron transport chain can continue. So uh, th this is the reason, right? So when you use the compound, you stimulate ATP production using electron transport chain, you must consume more oxygen to get rid of the final electrons, right? So that the electron don't accumulate. So the connection here is the way you justify this is to connect everything together, right? If the compound stimulates ATP productions and affects the electron transport chain, there must be an increase in oxygen as oxygen is required to remove the excess electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. So the answer key will take says here, more electron can be transferred so that more oxygen is required as a final electron acceptor. All right, so that's it. This will be... Uh, this is it, okay? All righty, so let's look, let's go back to the, um, so we're done with all the 2021, okay? Let's go back to some of these, um, okay? Uh, let's look at the data in a set, okay? So guys, um, for this one, okay, um, maybe we'll do the uh, free response first. Yeah, data in a set or free response? Let's look at data in a set, okay? So we just did the free response. So let's look at the first data in the set, please. This one. So you probably want to read a little bit uh, before we go into this. Okay. So if you look at seven, eight, nine, ten here, can you guys take a minute on this one, please? Let's just kind of read a little bit. So guys, uh, so guys at home, could you please take a look at this so that we can? Uh, I don't get to see you guys. I'm not sure. Okay. So please give that a try. Okay. We'll do. We'll give you guys about one minute to read the question. Yeah. One minute. So got one minute to read this question. We're doing multiple choice now. Yeah. About uh, one one minute. Yeah. Okay. So you should be done reading. So let's just take a look at this. A biologist spent many years researching the rate of evolutionary change in finch population. Okay, so if you know this is evolution, think about what causes evolution, right? So changing real frequency and mutation, natural selection causes, right? Uh, gene flow, genetic drift, sexual selection, right? So it was determined that the average beak size of finch in a certain population increased dramatically during intense drought. That kind of makes sense because when there's a drought, you have more uh, seeds that are, that are very hard coated, right? Very difficult to crack open. During the drought, there's a reduction in number of plants with thin wall seed that confirms your prediction. So number seven, which of the following procedure was most likely was most likely followed to determine the change in beak size. So these kind of questions, you have to read it. Uh, you can't just jump to the answer. You have to read all the choices and eliminate. So again, we want to determine the change in beak, um, beak size. So few finches were trapped in 1981, and again in 1987, and the beak size were compared. 
Okay, so that seems to be the things to do, right? So 1981 to you want to trap finches and you compare the sizes. And B, the big size in 15 finches were measured in 87. The B size in the original finch was determined by estimation. C, the B size in a large number of finches was measured every year from 1981 to 1987. But I think we found the best answer here, right? So you do want to measure the sizes, but you don't want to just measure two years, 81 and 87, and you don't want to use a few, right? So, and you don't want to estimate. Why estimate when you can catch them and actually get a more reliable data, right? So C would have to be the answer, okay? So they give you a whole bunch of choices. You have to read them. If you suspect A is the answer, because it looked pretty good, but then you want to keep going, maybe you'll find a better one. So C is the answer here. All right. Okay. Number eight, which of the following statement might be best explain the increase in average peak size in the finch population during drought? So which explains the increase in the peak size? So again, you have to read that and you eliminate. Very important skill. Finch with bigger beaks, better adapted to crack thin walled seeds. So that would be wrong. Uh, the whole point is that there is no, not enough thin walled seed. So no, okay. so A is off. Finches with bigger beaks can attack and kill finches. No, yeah, that, that is guess. Uh, that's scary, yeah. Okay, finches with bigger beaks possess more powerful flight muscle. No, it's not about the flight muscle. The key is they can crack large seeds that develop larger beaks. Um, Finches that crack larger seeds develop larger beaks over time. Yeah, they are the ones who survive and reproduce. Okay, all right, so that's number eight. So the answer is last one. Yeah, so you eliminate um, and see what you can do. Um, hold on. Let me, uh, let me read this again. Sorry, I think I read it wrong. There's a reduction in this one. Uh, actually, you know what? Between uh, A and D, let me read it again, yeah? Because I, I cross out A, but I'm, I'm reading the question. I think I read it wrong. So it says here that uh, during drought, there was a reduction in the number of plants with thin walled seeds. Okay, so there's a change in the population. Okay, so the question is that, which might be the best Explain increase in the average beak size. Bigger beaks better adapt, fed, able to crack this one. This is actually true. Yeah, I was being prejudiced against uh, thin wall. So there's less thin wall. So either way, they have bigger beaks. They're better adapted to crack any kind of seed and produce more offspring. D is kind of true also, but when I read this one, I don't want to say develop larger beaks over time because that seems like what Lamarck would say, use and disuse. So the answer is actually A here, yeah? A did not conflict the data. A is the best answer. So fingers with larger beaks were better uh, able to crack thin wall seeds and produce more offspring. That's why there's a shift in the average beak size, okay? So that is good. And this one here, they crack large seeds. I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption that there's large seeds. They didn't talk about any large seeds here. They just talk about thin wall seeds. And the way they say it feels like there's a Lamarck use and disuse. So A is the answer. Okay, let's look at number nine. Uh, which of the following describe the mechanism behind changing beak size in the finch population? Yeah. So the mechanism is natural selection here. Okay, it's not mutation, it's not gene flow, it has to be natural selection. So the formation, again, you have to read all of them. The formation of two finches from a single species doesn't make sense. This is evolution here, doesn't make sense, right? Changing frequency in the finch population due to selective pressure from the environment. Yeah, that, that is natural selection, okay? You have a selective pressure against finches with small beaks. Uh, new allele appear, that's the that only way to get new allele is mutation, no? Achievement of dynamic equilibrium in finch population is just homeostasis, doesn't even make sense, yeah. Okay, so number nine, the answer has to be B. It's a selective pressure resulting from changes in the environment. Okay. Number 10, uh, biologists discovered that from 88 to 93, the average beak size declined to pre-1981 level. So remember, the beak size 
from 81 to 87 start to shift it towards a larger one. And then they're saying that the next few years from 88 to 93, and the decline again. Okay, the reversal in the peak size is most likely related to which of the following events. So why would the peak size reversed? And now you shift the back, right? Loss of food supply, and of drought, increasing drought conditions, or increasing predator. So it has to be B, right? If there's no more drought, then the presumption is that you should come back to the original level, to the pre-1981 level. Because drought was the change, was the natural selection that causes their directional shift, right? Uh, there's no evidence that there's loss of food supply. If there is an increase in drought, then the B side should stay uh, large and, you know, um, directional selection, okay? All right, let's look at the next one, okay? Um, how about here, guys? Okay, what the heck are they graphing here? You got a lot of chemistry. These are amino acids, okay? Now, guys, amino acids, uh, if, in order to tell how many amino acids, just count the number of nitrogen if you're not good at this. If you have one nitrogen, that is one amino, one amino acid. Here's another one, right? So that's two amino acids. Here's one. And when they combine, don't you have to do dehydration synthesis, right? So you can remove this and this, this produce the water, and then this carbon double bonded to oxygen will connect there, okay? So that is the answer. The optimal position to perform dehydration synthesis, produce three amino acids is right here. A is the answer. This is the wrong end, okay? It has to be a carboxyl end produce uh, providing the OH and the amino end with H. So this is a little bit dehydration synthesis, okay? That will be the answer. Let's look at the next one. Um, we're going to go to data analysis first, okay? And then unless I see some question I want to talk about. Why don't we look at this one? I don't know what this is. So let's see number 13. The sequence for two short fragments of DNA are shown. Which of the following is one way the segments differ from each other? So you can see here the two segments have the same number of base pairs. Okay, so if you count as we one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, same thing here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So they have same number of base pairs, eleven base pairs. So segment one will not code for mRNA because both strands have T. Doesn't make sense. Okay, it, they they all DNA. There's no reason why segment one would not code for mRNA. The more soluble in water become denatured at lower temperature and must be a prokaryotic cell. So how do we decide, guys? Okay, so A is wrong. It doesn't make sense. Let's look at B. Segment one would be more soluble in water because it has more phosphate group. That is not correct. Every nucleotide has a phosphate, right? So I have two choices left. And D is nonsense because they're saying one must be from prokaryotes because that's predominantly TNA. No, yeah, that does not differentiate prokaryotic cell. So the answer is C, by elimination. So let's see. One would be denatured at lower temperature than two would, because AT have two hydrogen bound GCN3, exactly, right? TA are connected by two hydrogen bonding, and GC have stronger base pairing. So that allows GC to survive better uh, at higher temperature. In fact, if you look at the bacteria that live in hydrothermal vent, they have a lot more GC base pairs than they do TA base pairs uh, for that particular reason. So the answer is C. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, see if we have a data analysis. This is endocytosis. Nope, I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, this is ecological succession. So make sure you know that. One of the most important process in ecology. Okay, and uh, this is the lack of prong, chip off prong. So, all right, data analysis here. So let's look at 17 to 19. Can you guys take a minute on this one? Just read it, yeah. So for those at home, please do that. Okay, about one minute, please.
Okay, so it should be done. So the first thing is that you do need to know what a respirometer is. It measures how much oxygen is consumed. And both of these are animals that they do consume oxygen. So it measures the amount of oxygen consumed in terms of mils per gram per five minute interval trials. So just how many mils of O2 consumed, okay? Now, what do you want to program? So program is important. This will eliminate the need to fix the mouse weight, right? Uh, because it's per gram of mouse. So it doesn't matter if this is 12 gram, this is eight gram, doesn't matter. It's per gram of mouse. So that eliminates the need to use the mouse with the same weight. Because it would be stupid to find two mouse with the same weight, but you can just divide it by grams, right? That they, they are. So that's, that's what that is. I want to point that out. And it's per minute, okay? So, uh, and we, by looking at the data, initially it doesn't really register much. The only thing that registers is that mouse have higher, higher oxygen consumption, right? Than crickets, which is lower, right? So that's the only thing we know. Okay, and let's look at the questions, yeah? So number 17, during aerobic respiration, Oxygen is consumed at the same rate as CO2 is produced. So that's true. And this is true because you have C6H12O6. You will use six oxygen and you also produce six CO2 when you balance the equation. The six CO2 produced offsets the six oxygen. So the question is, in order to provide accurate volumetric measurement of oxygen gas, an experimental setup would include which of the following? So the respirometer, when you set it up, you have to get rid of CO2 so you can measure how much oxygen is consumed. So you would have to have substance that removes CO2. So for instance, uh, the respirometer could be like this, yeah? So this is the respirometer uh, and you have a pipette, a very thin pipette that leads to this chamber. Let's say you put a mouse in here, Okay, so again, you put the mouse in here and the mouse will use O2 and produce CO2. So if I'm trying to use the pipette, which is graduated to measure the amount of oxygen consumed, I would have to put a little bit water here and that is enough to use as a marker. You see that uh, when oxygen is used, water will move down. When oxygen is being used, that little drop of water stuck between the pipette will move down. If it moved down 20 mil, that means 20 mils of oxygen is used. So this is how you measure oxygen consumption using this respirometer, okay? So make sure you know that. You can put whatever organism in here. You can put cricket, you can put plant. This is respirometer. Measures how much oxygen consumed using a pipette. However, because the CO2 produced, you are gonna push the water back up. So CO2 produced at the same rate, six and six pushes back up. So in order to get an accurate one, you gotta put a substance that removes CO2. So a lot of the time they put a cotton swab here and then they put potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. These hydroxides, they absorb CO2 produced by, by the mouse so that the water will indeed go down as oxygen is being consumed. All right, that is a fine detail in the respirometer, okay? So that would be the answer for part 17. So you have to kind of know it. All right, let's look at the next one. Number 18, according to the data, the mice at 10 degrees Celsius demonstrated greater oxygen consumption than mice at 25. So 10 versus 25, what causes uh, which is explained by what, yeah? So you see mice, mice at 10 degrees use more oxygen. Why than mice at 25? Okay, what is your guess, guys? Yeah, so if you are a mammal, which is mouse, then, okay, like humans, doesn't have to be mouse, you will use more oxygen at a colder temperature uh, because at a colder temperature, your body needs to maintain constant body temperature is going to have higher rate of metabolism, right? To keep yourself warm, you have to burn more heat, burn more sugar. 
you have to consume more oxygen because the temperature drop. This is true if you're warm-blooded, right? Remember, if you're warm-blooded, you maintain constant body temperature, you call endothermic. okay? Right, you see that is not the case for crickets because crickets are cold-blooded. So they don't maintain constant body temperature. So their metabolism increases with increasing temperature. It's entirely dependent on the environment. Us, we maintain a constant uh, uh, body temperature. So when it's cold, we actually have the increased metabolism, which is measured by oxygen in order to maintain the same body temperature. So that's the whole point, yeah? So we're talking about the mice though, okay? And if you didn't know that, right? You can just guess, right? Is it because it weighs less? No, because we program, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, the mice at 25 were more active, not counterintuitive. If you're more active, you should use more oxygen. So that's just garbage, right? So also B, the mice at 10 had a lower metabolic rate. If you had a lower metabolic rate, you should have less oxygen, right? So that all these are counterintuitive. So by elimination, we don't have to read A. A must be the answer, right? So the mice at zero, uh, 10, had a higher rate of ATP production than 25. It didn't ask you to explain why. This is just some fact, okay? So A is the answer. That's the next one. Um, number 19, according to the data, so here's the data. Cricket at 25 degrees Celsius have greater oxygen consumption. And that is true, right? You see that? 38 is greater than 13, okay? And programmed tissue, yeah. Then do crickets at 10. This trending oxygen consumption is opposite that in the mice. Yeah, the difference in oxygen consumption among cricket and mice is due to their size, nutrition, or the mode of internal temperature regulation or ATP production, right? So if you're not sure, the answer is C. You know the size don't matter because per gram. Nutrition, no, okay, because it's just random guess. And mode of ATP is likely the same because animal use cellular respiration, yeah? So you have two choices, you can guess. Uh, then you, you should go for uh, C, yeah? Because warm-blooded versus cold-blooded. So eliminate two, and if you really don't know what to do, can't find the answer, then guess, okay? The likely you'll guess it correctly, yeah? Okay, uh, this is osmosis question, let's not do that. Let's look at another one, yeah? Okay, uh, oh, here's another data in the set, okay? Could you take uh, a minute on this, yeah? And then uh, I know it's a little bit small, sorry. So, um, try to come next week in person, yeah, isn't that better? Okay, so take this one minute. Um, I'm gonna use the restroom, I'll be right back. So, I think should have done finished reading. <clears throat> I'm just going to read it again. Now, um, so you have 20 tobacco seeds, tobacco supplies, right? And then uh, of the same species on moist paper, 
paper towel, and you have two petri dishes, A and B. The wrap completely in or opaque cover to exclude all light. That's what A is. So A is uh, no light. And B was not wrapped. The dishes were then equal distance from light source. So make sure that the light is constant, okay? And to a cycle of 14 hours of light and 10 hours of dark. Okay, so all other conditions were the same for both. The dishes were examined after seven days and the opaque cover was permanently removed from dish A. So the only difference is the first seven days. Dish A was covered, so darkness, and dish B, uh, dish B was not covered the whole time. And then uh, the cover was removed, so the rest of the seven days, they all have light, yeah? Both dishes were returned to the light and examined again at 14 days. The data were obtained, yeah? So it's kind of weird to look at the data right now, but you can see is the effect of light. This is dark, okay? and this is light, right? And this is uh, light and light. Okay, so um, now this is about seed germination. So somehow the AB bio people are fascinated with germinating seed. Now, first thing is that uh, when seed germinates, it does not, it does not use uh, uh, does not use light. We already said that, right? Now, what about green leaves and yellow leaves? Yeah, uh, the leaves have to turn green in order to start photosynthesis. So initially, it's kind of yellow, and then it's going to turn green. Then you you do photosynthesis. Yeah, and also the mean stem length. So we weren't able to read this because okay, it's, it's not there. So the the stem length. Um, the stem will want to grow as tall as possible. Why do you think a plant wants to grow as tall as possible before they start to foliate, right? Uh, it's because they want to search for light, right? So you can see that when they are covered right here, they're actually longer when they're in dark than they were in light, okay? So it's because the stem is trying to grow taller and taller, trying to search for light. So that is an evolutionary advantage for plants being able to do that. You don't want to foliage when there's when you're too short. You want to keep growing, divert all the resources to grow tall. And then when you're tall enough, you start to grow and you hog all the lights, right? So uh, and also, so so here you can see that uh, if you in light, all of them germinated. So there's only 20 seedlings. What this means is that 20 germinated after seven days. So they remain germinated. But what about this? How many germinated in the first seven days in the dark? 12. So eight did not germinate. Until seven days later, those eight germinated. So that's why you have 20 at the end of the 14 day. Yeah. So 12 germinated, the rest of the eight germinated in the second half. So that kind of shows you that seems like light is required for germination, right? And if you look at this too, if you are light, you have 15 green ceilings and five is yellow after seven days in light. That's total 20 plants. And then remained as such, right? However, if you are in dark, this is the dark again, okay? There's no green one, they remain yellow. The 12 germinated one had yellow seeds. And then once you have light for the rest of the seven days, Okay, the, then some of the yellow one turn into green and some remain yellow, right? So this is roughly the same, right? 15, this is about 15 to six, uh, 15 to five, about the same, okay? So some of the yellow one turn green and some remain yellow, just like that, okay? And then again, the, when you are dark, you know, the stem is longer. If you are lit, then the stem is short. It just comes out and start to germinate, start to green and start to do photosynthesis, yeah? Okay, otherwise in the dark, they try to grow longer and longer. So that's what the results mean. And initially you don't want to overanalyze results like what I'm doing. I'm just want to show you some of the intricate details for the results. So number 26, according to the result of the experiment, germination of tobacco plant during the first week is increased by exposure to light, unaffected by light, that's not true, right? We're looking at that. Prevented by paper tower, no. Accelerated in green leaf 
ceiling. Then I say, right? Be pretty simple. You twelve versus hundred percent versus like sixty percent, right? Twelve over twenty. All right, that's the answer there. Let's look at the second one. Uh, the most probable. I have this uh, unstable internet sometimes. Okay, the most probable cause for the difference in the mean stem length between plant dish A and dish B is which of the following, right? Okay, so again, uh, this one has to do with the, uh, uh, that'll be this one, yeah? The eight millimeter versus the three, okay? So what is the most likely cause for the difference in the stem? Shortening of the cell, in response to the lack of light, no. Uh, so be B, right? Elongation of the ceiling respond to lack of light, right? So these are longer because they are, there's no light, okay? Dark, no light, they elongate, okay? Uh, enhance of the elongation by light, then, okay, there's actually shorter. So that just conflict the data. Genetic differences, no, that should be the same seed, right? Okay, number 28, which of the following best support the hypothesis that the difference in leaf color is genetically controlled? Ugh, okay, what the? The difference in leaf color is genetically controlled. I'm looking at this. You know, even though you give it all light for 14 days, you still have three to one ratio, green to yellow, right? Even if you cover it in the dark for seven days and light, you still get about three to one approximately, right? This is the real world. So you do see a little discrepancy. So to me is that maybe they're just bound to be yellow. These are bound to be green, yeah? So the number of yellow leaves ceiling in dish A as seven day, day seven. Uh, dish A as seven days is the number of 12. So that's the that's this one here. The number of germinated seeds in dish A on day seven and fourteen. Germinated seeds. Mm, this has nothing to do with color. Yeah. So no. The death of all yellow. That is not true. The yellow one did not all die. You still have five and six, right? The existence of yellow leaf ceiling as well as green one on day fourteen in dish B. So that will be this one. So between A and D, which one shows that the color of the leaves are genetically controlled? I think the best answer is D because there's still yellow ones, even though the yellow and green ones, whether you have light or dark, yeah? So I think D would be the most decisive support, okay? All right, let's look at the next one. So that was a little bit harder, I think, but you have to eliminate, okay guys, the key, skill in AP multiple choice that you gotta eliminate. Additional observation were made on day 21. So you leave it another week. No yellow ceiling were found alive, they are dead. What is the most likely, right? Yellow leaf ceiling were unable to absorb water. Uh, water has to a root, you know? Taller green leaves block the light, prevent photosynthesis. We have no information about their height. They're about the same height, so probably not. And see, yellow ceilings were unable to convert light energy into chemical energy, a higher rate of respiration of in yellow. No, so the answer is C. Uh, you want to have um, green leaves uh, that maximizes photosynthesis. So yellow one is not as good at photosynthesizing. That would be the best answer, yeah? Alrighty. Let's move on to the next data in a set. So that was an experiment there. So a lot of the data, data in a set, as you see, they are experiment and data. And you have to just be patient looking at this, yeah. Okay, another one, let's see. Uh, hmm. Can we look at this one, actually? Uh, this one here has to do with embryonic development. Okay. Uh, so here, the first diagram below shows the level of mRNA. Now, if I were to ask you a very general knowledge question on the free response, what do genes code for, right? So what do genes code for? Genes code for proteins, and they also code for RNAs. Uh, a lot of the gene code for a different type of RNA that were never, never translated to protein. So you can think about 50-50, okay? So DNA, 
which are the genes that call for this. You can also say they call for traits because that's what the phenotypes are, right? The proteins are the phenotype. You can also say that they call for enzyme, they call for receptors, they call for transport protein, they call for ion channels, they call for anything that's protein, right? So this is a very general answer uh, to if the question asks you, what do genes code for? So here we have a bunch of mRNA and we are, we're told there's two from two different genes, the bicoid gene and caudal gene, so B and C genes, yeah? A different position along the anterior posterior axis. Anterior means the head, posterior is the butt, right? So you have these different proteins. So if I would ask you here, if you look at this diagram, okay? So you have a Drosophila, which is the fruit fly egg immediately before fertilization. The second diagram shows uh, after fertilization. So if I were to ask you, before fertilization is the first diagram, and if you look at after fertilization would be the second diagram right here. What's the difference, right? So again, uh, you can see the left side is the interior and the right side is the posterior. So immediately after fertilization, you have a zygote, you have an embryo, you have a baby maggot wants to grow. And you can see that uh, to develop the head, you'll need the bicoid protein, and this is the mRNA. So do you see that bicoid is required for the anterior development? Well, I shouldn't say that. Let me say it again. This is the mRNA. This is the protein distribution, okay? So before fertilization, your caudal mRNA is constant in the, in the, in the egg. And the bicoid is high near head. So my assumption is that bicoid is required for head development. You need to you need to use mRNA to develop the head and caldo, we don't care, yeah? And then uh, immediately after fertilization, the protein means these are translated. And that does suggest that, yeah, you make a whole bunch of bicoid proteins, which is needed for head development, bicoid for the head. And then the caldo proteins are produced and they are required for the posterior development. So that's what the diagram is saying, yeah? Bicoid proteins required for head after fertilization, right? And uh, immediately after fertilization, you have a lot of differentiation and development and codo is for the, for the butt, for the posterior. So with that in mind then, one question, which of the following conclusion is best supported? So bicoid protein inhibits translation of Codo mRNA. So there's a lot of detail here. Okay, so you have to read the <clears throat> have to read the data. What about uh, bicoid protein stabilizes codo mRNA? Okay, and translation of bicoid mRNA produce codo protein. You can toss that one out. Uh, bicoid mRNA cannot produce codo protein. So toss out the stupid ones and then focus on the one that you need to focus on. Caudal protein stimulates the interior. Well, caudal protein is but, so no. So I have eliminated two easily because they conflict the data. So now you gotta look at A and B, okay? Which one is more true, right? Because we don't know about this. You're learning new stuff. So I gotta zoom out quite a bit. So A looks like uh, bicoid protein, which are these. These are the bicoid proteins. They inhibit translation of caudal. Well, uh, that is true because look, there's caudal mRNA here in the head region, but it's not translated. There's no caudal protein, no caudal proteins, but there are caudal mRNA. So why is that? So it must be suppressed. How come you have the caudal mRNA in the head region, but there's no caudal proteins? Because the bicoid protein must suppress, inhibit the caudal mRNA. That, that is the best answer, what the data is saying, okay? That, and the second one is not true. If the bicoid protein stabilizes the caudal mRNA, the, the, the caudal mRNA is irrelevant to whether you have the bicoid protein or not. It's constant level, right? So B is actually a false statement according to the data. So you kind of have to read it a few times. 
And this is why question like this, you'll see on the, this year's AP that they give you one page on one question. And usually they give you a lot more reading to slow you down. So don't get trapped in there and try to answer the question and waste five minutes on it. It's just for one point. Get to the other questions as soon as you can. Let's look at the next one. Um, another data in the set. I think we're almost there. Okay. All right, let's look at this data in a sec. We haven't seen these kind of questions for a while. This is uh, more molecular biology. So number 44 to 46, let's read this one together. It says, in a transformation experiment, so that means you put a DNA into a bacteria culture and you shock them so that the bacteria will take in the foreign DNA and become part of their own, right? This is one of the major ways bacteria become different. So what do you do? You have E. coli mixed with plasmid containing the gene for antibiotic resistance, uh, ampicillin resistance gene. So if you take the plasmid, you are resistant. This is the plasmid, a circle DNA that allows the bacteria that takes it, that transform to become resistant, okay? Plasma was not added to a second sample. So the first sample, you mix them. Second one is no plasma. <coughs> So you can see the result. Okay, samples were then plated on nutrient agar. So there's two types of nutrient, either a broth, which is liquid, liquid nutrient, or an agar plate, which is on the petri dish, solid nutrient. So you can put it on a agar, which is a solid medium, or a broth, which is a soup nutrient, yeah? So both of which were supplanted with antibiotic ampicillin. Ampicillin will kill the bacteria. The result of E. coli growth are summarized. The shaded area means lots of growth. And dotted are individual colony. Okay, so this is what we have. Okay, so this is what we get. So let's see if they make sense, guys. Your wild type E. coli, that just means your regular E. coli. If there's no ampicillin to kill them, lots of growth. That makes sense. And here, you put ampicillin, no growth no growth at all because they all die right how do you survive ampicillin you have to have the plasmid so you can see if you don't put ampicillin lots of growth whether you have the plasmid or not but here you put ampicillin and only the one that are transformed survive so these are transformed if you're transformed your ampicillin resistant survive okay all the wild type that did not transform die so you get uh, only a fraction right of the bacteria so all these are transformed that's how they survive so that's what the data is saying kind of makes sense right okay so what are we doing here we're looking for plates that only have ampicillin resistant bacteria growing so no wild type only ampicillin that would be four right because only the one that have ampicillin resistance survive. So the answer is C, all right? So just have to read the data, it's not too bad. And then if you look at 41, which of the following best explains why there are no growth in plate two? Well, there's no growth in plate two because nobody are resistant to ampicillin, so everyone dies, okay? So that's basically the reason. There's no transformation occurring there. So if you look at this one then, um, the initial bacteria culture were not ampicillin resistant. Oh, that's pretty good. The transformation procedure killed the bacteria. That makes sense. Agar inhibits growth. No, agar is the nutrient. Bacteria will transform. If you're transformed, you should be resistant. So the only choice left is A, elimination. Yeah. So eliminate a stupid answer. They'll put some in there. All right, let's look at 42. Um, plate one and three were included to do what? Okay, so what is one and three? Purpose for one and three? Well, I think they're control, right? One is the control for two. It shows you that ampicillin kills and that the original wild type are not resistant. And three is kind of control for four. You can think of that way because the difference is antibiotic, right? So if you, uh, three, yeah. So let's see what the answer key says, okay? 
So uh, one and three, okay? What is the proof of one and three? To demonstrate that E. coli culture were viable, that means they, are, they, are, they, are, so they can survive, that's true. Um, the plasma can lose the gene, doesn't make sense. Plasma has a gene. Demonstrate that the plasmid is needed for E. growth. It is needed. And one, C1, there's a bunch of growth. Here in the wild type, there's no plasmid, right? So that is a false statement. So if it's a false statement, you cross that out. So you kind of reduce your, improve your chances right here. So that's wrong. Prepare E. coli for transformation. No, that's not how you prepare. So the one and three must be demonstration that the E. coli are not already dead. They're viable, okay? So that would be the only answer. Let's look at two more. Which of the following statement best describes why there are fewer colonies on plate four than on plate three? Well, we knew because the one that did not transform died, right? Not all E. coli cells were successfully transformed. The one that did not transform died because this has ampicillin. This has none, right? No ampicillin. Plate four is a positive control? No. Okay. Uh, bacteria on plate three did not mutate. There's nothing to do with mutation. Plasma inhibit doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. So you, worst to worst, you have two choices. Uh, this is not a positive control. Um, this is your experiment, yeah? your control. You, you want to use a negative control here. Positive control does not make sense. Um, all right, that was, that was that. Okay, let's see if we have any more. Say that in a set. It is not a data in a set, but can you take a look at this for one sec? Okay, this is about em embryonic development also. So you can see that here, I got an anterior, the head, and the posterior. I got one, two, three, four cell in this embryo. Okay, so see what's happening here, yeah. The diagram uh, is a little bit hard to, to read it. So the diagram above, whoa, it's a lot of, lot of reading. Wow, ah, I thought we were done, okay. So the diagram above shows a developing warm embryo in a four cell stage. Experiments have shown that when cell three divides, the anterior daughter cell gave rise to muscle and gonad. Okay, so if I come back to the diagram, so they're saying cell three. Here. So the daughter cell of cell three becomes muscle and gonad. Gonad is the testy and ovary, right? And then, uh, so the other one must be the posterior daughter cells of cell three. Okay, they gave rise to intestine. Well, that's weird. The anterior daughter cell becomes different tissues. Okay, it's kind of weird. Okay, all right. So let's see. Uh, continue with the reading. So I'm going to highlight the important stuff. So again, uh, when cell three divides, anterior becomes muscle and gonad, and the posterior becomes intestine. However, if the cells of the embryo are separated from each other early no intestine will form. So if you take them apart, separate from each other, you're not gonna get, the posterior portion will not have, not become intestine, weird. And then the cells experiment have shown that cell three and cell fours are recombined. If you recombine them, after the initial separation, the posterior gave rise to normal intestine again. So that shows you obviously that cell four is needed to induce cell three to become intestine. Because it says that no intestine will form if you separate, and then if you rejoin them with cell four, then you get intestine again. So cell four is necessary, right? So there must be a cell communication here. Four is required for the proper development of intestines by cell three. So what is the most likely explanation of this, okay? So uh, if you did not make that conclusion, you just keep reading and eliminate. As cell surface protein, a cell surface protein on cell four signal cell three to induce the formation of worms intestine. That seems to be what I was saying. The plasma membrane of cell four interact with plasma membrane of posterior portion of cell three 
resulting in vaccination and become microvilli. Ooh, that is possible too. Microvilli is uh, is part of the intestine. It's the folded uh, projections of the intestine. Okay, so so we got to figure out differentiate those two. Cell three pass electro signal to cell four, which induces differentiate. No, it is is the presence of four that's important. Yeah. Cell four transfer genetic material. No, you can stop there. They do not share DNA. Uh, you have identical DNA. So we have now picked between A and B. Yeah. Okay. So let's look for clues. Um, if cell three and cell four are recombined after the initial separation, the posterior daughter cells of cell three will give rise to normal intestine. Okay. So. B is extremely specific. It's saying that the imaginations of the cells become the microvilli of the intestine. That is too specific, yeah? Uh, it, we only know it has to do with intestine. So, and usually the communication is at the surface, right? It's protein receptor. So here I would say that uh, a surface protein on cell signals cell three. So four signals three to induce the formation of intestine. This is the more general answer. When you are having such a specific answer, you have to look for clues whether there's warranty for such specificity. Uh, in this case, A is the best answer, yeah? It's general and is answering the question. Well, all we know is normal intestine. So we don't know what part of the intestine. So microvilli will be super specific, yeah? Okay, uh, that was that one, okay. If you hate genetics, you're gonna see genetics, right? Of course. Let's look at this one, 51 to 53. This is uh, hemoglobin. So we have hemoglobin as well as myoglobin. Myoglobin, especially in deep divers, I think we talked about two weeks ago, if your CO has lots of myoglobin, whales have lots of myoglobin, they just store oxygen. So that the deep sea divers, they have a bunch of them. Uh, hemoglobin transport, so hemoglobin will transport oxygen to muscles and then will pass oxygen to myoglobin for storage. So they're proteins that bind reversibly, so they can let go as well. That's the whole point, right? You wanna to deliver to cells ultimately. The graph below shows oxygen binding saturation for two different concentrations. If you look at this, yeah. Now this, this graph is called Bohr shift effect, similar to Bohr shift, okay? Uh, myoglobin, hemoglobin, if I would ask you who has stronger affinity for hemo, hemo, uh, oxygen will be myoglobin. Have a stronger attraction for O2 at any partial level, yeah? At any places, because the saturation with oxygen is higher in myoglobin than hemoglobin. For example, if you look at 30 uh, here, hemoglobin is less than 50%, myoglobin is like 90%. So it has stronger attraction for oxygen. Okay. And low CO, low oxygen means that you have tissues. High oxygen, you have lungs, right? So this is what partial pressure of oxygen tells you. All right, so that's important. And this can also be fetal hemoglobin, and this can also be mom's hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is HB, yeah? So fetal hemoglobin must have stronger attraction, okay, for, uh, for, the, uh, for, for oxygen than mom's, because otherwise mother will not give up the hemoglobin to baby. So this is also that. This also could be your hemoglobin when you exercise, okay? When you exercise, there will be a shift to the right. So this is the hemoglobin binding when you exercise, meaning that you have lower oxygen affinity while exercising when the blood pH is low, okay? So there's three graphs that looks identical. Again, the first graph, the last graph, uh, the third graph that we talked about is when you exercise, your hemoglobin literally shift to the right. It will lower the, uh, the oxygen affinity. So you have low oxygen affinity. So you can deliver them to cells that need oxygen when you exercise, when blood pH is low. Second one is myoglobin hemoglobin. The third one is fetal hemoglobin. 
And mom's hemoglobin also looks like this. So you only remember three things about this graph, okay? So which of the following statement is correct? If you look at this, okay? Uh, so this is reading off the chart, okay? So if you look at the first one, at 10, hemoglobin by an oxygen myoglobin does not. That is not true, right? At 10, is right here. They both bind to oxygen, right? So A is garbage. At 20, myoglobin, hemoglobin, equal amount. That's not true either. At 20, myoglobin binds a lot more. So this is garbage. You just toss it out, eliminate. At 40, myoglobin has greater affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. And 80, myoglobin has twice as much. So 80 is not twice as much. They start to come together. So the answer 80 is 80 is not twice as much, right? So the answer is C. Okay. At 40 is higher. Okay. So let's look at the next one. Uh, 52. Strenuous exercise lower the blood pH, causing a curve for both of them to shift to the right. That's what we're saying. Yeah. So why do you want to shift to the right? You want to unload oxygen. Increasing binding side, capture more, no, capture more, no. So you want to unload oxygen. You want to lower your affinity. If both shift to the right, you're lowering affinity at every single partial pressure of oxygen. So that's the answer. So the answer is A. And 53, which of the following best describe the physiological significance of different oxygen binding capabilities? So why, why do they bind oxygen differently? Because they prevent muscle from depleting. They prevent also glycogen, the enhance the movement. So this one, yeah. They enhance the movement of oxygen from blood into muscle. So that uh, oxygen will unload and oxygen goes into the muscle. Um, myoglobin is in the muscle for storage, okay? So that's the purpose here. They have to have different affinity. If they're reversed, then hemoglobin will not give up oxygen to myoglobin then that kind of defeats the movement of oxygen, okay? All righty. So guys, uh, this test, what I want you to do is that uh, this week, can you do the free response and rest of the multiple choice? Yeah. And the answer, I'm going to just include it in the back, yeah? So you don't have to turn in. Um, but what I want you to do, look at some of these questions. Right? There's a few more questions I want to talk about here. Um, and then uh, if you look at the free response, so focus on the free response and do the multiple choice. There's a few more questions I want to talk about next week. Okay, if you look at the free response, I don't think you've done the free response. Um, just give me one sec, yeah? Yeah, I don't think you've done the free response. So just do some of the free response, look it over. Uh, the free response, I think there's only one or two questions I want. I think they're good. Yeah, this one is good experiment about transpiration, which is part of the lab. And just do as much as you can. Look at the answer key, yeah? So finish this. I'll post this uh, after, the, after the test. And I'll see you guys next time, okay? All right. Thanks, guys. We'll stop here. Okay, take care, guys. Study hard. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, guys.